Uh, we are going to take about an hour uh, of first comments by Sarojini Ganju Thakur, who's our uh, invited speaker for this panel. Um, and then you, we'll have a facilitated Q&A um, question and answer session, a discussion session, and now we are sort of set up for now for a discussion session. So we will definitely have that for about 15 minutes. We'll break for tea for 15 minutes, and then we will hear our young scholars speak on a varied ideas about public spaces. So given I have read and commented on all the papers, I'd like to give you a little glimpse on it, primarily because I want you all to come back, despite the physical discomfort. So we are going to be really, uh, and hopefully I think Sarojini will also have this conversation with a lot of you. At CBPS, we have been really trying to, uh, and I won't use the word deconstruct because I'm tired of it, but we are trying to explore the deeper meaning of what public spaces mean and what gendered experiences of public spaces are. Uh, and that can mean anything from, for example, political representation to the way that Aruna Roy spoke about, about what does it mean when public spaces are you know, shrinking and what does that mean for democratic thought? What does that mean for just accessibility? So if we are thinking about democracy as access, then one of the major areas in which that battle is fought is in the public space, right? And what defines it? Who defines it? How is it used? Who are the actors who define it? So we want to go back not just to the ideas of public spaces, but also in the lived experiences of all of you, right? So uh, the reason why I like gender as a subject is because it's easily relatable to everything, right? So I can take, uh, I always do this in my, my classes earlier in a different time, is I don't need anything else outside of this room. All I have, if, if it's just this room and this experiences of all of you, we can actually explore a whole lot of things, right? The, the theory, the practice, all of it, all of your experiences make it that much more richer. So therefore, the facets of public spaces that, I mean, so obviously we are not going to be able to capture everything of your interest that is aligned to your uh, specific interest with respect to public spaces, but we are trying to capture, for example, what does it mean in terms of the availability of institutions and how that availability is related to costing, right? So how do financing of those relationships work? Because if you're saying, okay, we need about 100 uh, one-stop centers, what does that actually mean in terms of numbers? And if that number is not available, if that budget line is not there, what does that mean for women uh, in distress? So one of our panelists will speak about that. Uh, the second panel is about the very idea, uh, idea of identity. Like, so for example, we are looking at the legal definition of what a transgender identity means. And because that identity is so expressed in public spaces and it's contested in public spaces, and it's you know sort of pushed against in public spaces, what does that mean? have an engagement with. The second thing is often when we're talking about especially gender violence in public spaces, we are constantly thinking about urban spaces because most of us, you know, urbanized sort of citizens. And although, I mean, this is true, we are in increasingly becoming urban. Our public spaces are increasingly streets. That's absolutely true. But we have very little notion of what that means when we say access to public spaces. What do roads mean? What do streets mean in rural spaces? We have very little understanding. So we will also capture that in one of the panels, and Krishna will be talking a little bit more about that. And then I'll go back to our work, actually last, uh, with respect to what we have been doing with public spaces is really trying to explore uh, the complexity of what public spaces is, trying to create a complex systems mapping. Uh, we are really, right. I mean, I think I have a complex systems expert in this room who will probably be cringing the way I'm using that frame. But I think it's really to try and understand the way in which different actors and relationships sometimes f start to form certain forms of public spaces that are not necessarily um, material but very discursive. And I know that a lot, that word is very problematic, but if you have you know, paid attention to the first panel, they were talking about how discourse is very significant. And research is about changing discourse. Research is, and the thing is, a lot of our experiences with material things is through discourse. So hopefully we will have a little bit of a conversation around what that discursive element means for the lived experiences of women who deal with it, and so that would be the, so that's that's our pitch for coming back after tea break. And so now I will introduce our first speaker, our invited speaker, uh, Sarojini Ganju Thakur. Uh, 
she was in administrative service and retired. Actually, I will make it very small. Or maybe I'll speed talk it, which I actually can, can do. Uh, and she retired at, uh, as uh, additional chief Rex, secretary government of Himachal Pradesh. Uh, she is a specialist in gender and development, sustainable livelihoods, education, climate change. She received the Prime Minister's award for her initiative for plastic eradication in Himachal Pradesh. And in a recent, yes, that is, that is significant. Thank you. And uh, uh, recently, I think I was on her panel with her for gender budgeting. And I was really, you know, uh, it's, it's quite heartening to see the way that um, she also articulated. Uh, basically, she asked the government, why don't you you know, like the way that I, in my head, how I remembering it is she was kind of pushing back against um, conversations around, oh, you know, this can't be done, that can't be done. She said, you know, there's no harm in having uh, evaluation and monitoring of government systems because what is, we can only learn from those kinds of questions and those. So she was actually very, um, she was trying to get them to say that questions are not bad. And so with that, I also want, uh, I would encourage all of you to ask questions. So these are very young scholars who are going to be presenting. They will be enriched by your questions because they will think in ways that they have never thought about. So we welcome discussion, we welcome questions. And now over to you, Sarojini. Let's say common ways of how public spaces are perceived. To a large extent, um, public spaces quite often, you know, people think of it only in physical terms. Physical terms in terms of areas which can be used publicly by anybody. And actually, that has been a very traditional way of looking at public spaces, is that, you know, people have access to them and it's, it's everybody has equal access, there's equality. If there's a road, anybody can go on it. But that's the old definition of public spaces, as you can see in the UN Habitat uh, definition. Now, it has to go beyond uh, that, because public spaces is, whereas there could be universal access, the point is that public spaces have to be you know, like today, there was a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion and ensuring that everybody who has, no matter where you are, whether you're rural, urban, rich, poor, that everybody can access. And actually, that doesn't happen. You just have to look around you. Just go to a park. I don't know in Bangalore, but I know in Delhi, if you go to any park and you see who plays in the park, you'll see a body, you know, all the open spaces are kind of taken over by men. And I'm talking about parks. I'm not talking about. If you just go and see um, sort of the way, or I love the example that was given by um, a woman, uh, a planner, about toilets, the distribution of toilets. You can travel for hours in, in, on, by road in India. And unless you stop at a petrol pump, there will be no toilet for women. There's no thought. There's no planning. There's, you know, so, so, so there's, I mean, there's an invisibility about women's needs, which actually impacts on the way women and other genders, I'm talking about transgenders, access and have use of both the city and rural areas. So that is the thing. Now, when talking about public spaces, what I think is we have to go beyond and think that actually all these things are dependent on institutions. And those institutions actually have a body of social norms and rules which regulate behavior, whether it's in the household, whether it's in the community, which actually impacts on the way people interact with their environment, with, be it in a city or be it. And that has impact on the way the kind of jobs you do, the kind of times you go out, on your mobility, on your uh, access to health facilities, on a whole gamut of things. So when we look at the issue of access and industry, we have to be very aware that it's not just about seeing equal numbers in a particular spot. It's actually trying to deal with the institutional factors which limit the um, access of women, and access doesn't also mean just physical presence. If you think of the public space, the public space is also about, let's say, people being present. How many women 
police personnel are there? How many women drivers are there? How many transgender drivers are there? And what is the environment which actually supports that thing? I mean, it was a really good example, I think, it was in Kerala, where they employed a lot of transgender uh, in the metro. And then um, it was about 27 or something that they'd employed. And uh, how many stayed is the issue? How many stayed? They couldn't. They couldn't find accommodation. It had nothing to do with the job. So, I mean, it's all very well. And I was very happy to hear today that, you know, Karnataka has made this provision for 1% for, for that. That is a forward. But you have to think of the whole gamut of issues. I mean, you have a column in a school admission form which says, you know, transgender, but then there is nobody who actually honors it. And there is a whole contestation about admission. Or if you look at this, the government has set up a whole lot of what they call women's ITIs. They're either women's ITIs or the transgenders just can't get in. So I mean, so this is that's why you need to look at a whole gamut of issues that uh, affect. So basically, let's just f forget you know this concept that spaces are gender neutral is absolutely like saying that you know it's like formal equality. It's like saying that you know things are available, but we know that actually it it's it's not true. So as I said that. Uh, we need to f dismiss this myth of gender neutrality and realize that everything in the public space is actually dominated by patriarchal thinking. Why? Because all these institutions, there's a dominance of men and the kind of power that is exercised, say, in households, families, or in, even in the state because of numerically higher sort of is patriarchal. And they determine exactly what happens. So there's a lot, I mean, don't go out at this time, say in a household, or you know, what is permissible that if you go out in the community, wear a gungat. All this is your relationship with the public space. And then there is, and this I want to say, the, there is always the, the male gaze. I mean, this dominates a lot of thinking about how women dress, times they go out, how they're looked at, how they're perceived, etc. So that absolutely changes the nature of the relationship of women and the public space. And the other thing is, despite all the acts and laws, it's just like with women's laws, there is a lot of lack of clarity, both at the political and bureaucratic level, about how to actually do things to ensure neutrality. You can have a transgender uh, person's uh, act, which is protecting their rights, but when it comes to implementation, you find that budgetary provisions are actually minuscule. According to the act, you have equal right to everything, livelihoods, education, employment. But how do you translate that? So that commitment of actually, thing, and that's where the whole issue of financial allocations comes in. So, so first, there is no gender neutrality. You have to be proactively be aware of that. And the other thing is, I think we also have to interrogate this concept of private and public spaces a little. There are a continuum. There is no such thing. I mean, there. Are, the sort of, let's say, the classical thing is, oh, woman's in the house, she's inside, outside is, you know, the public space, men tend to dominate there, etc. and there's a tukka. But actually, there is a huge interrelationship between the private space and the public space, because if you think of, um, in, first, just think of something like in a rural area, because we're talking about rural areas, everybody knows everything about everybody. In a small area, they tend to know, think they know who's come to your house. They will ask you, you know, kal koi larki ko dekha tha. Now, you know, wo aapke ghar aai thi. I mean, that means that everybody is keeping an eye on you, or they know you've come out, or you've come back from. So if you get married, especially if you have an intercaste marriage, 
is it just a private matter? Marriage should be. But no, it's not. Then the whole community jumps into the fray. They could even take in North India some kind of action against things. So, so this concept of strictly dividing private and public, I think, is very uh, contentious. And you have to see it as a continuum. Because there is a huge interplay in institutions in terms of behavior. And, uh, I'd just like you to go to the next slide, just so that I could finish the thought. If you see, I mean, basically, the way institutions work, you know, the same kind of norms that prevail in the household, you would find them replicating themselves both at the community level, whether it's the protective aspect or the fact that you're dealing more with care or care in the household, care in, you know, you are the Anganwadi workers. The state, look at the way there's unpaid work, unpaid care at home, and when the state, when you think of how they deal with Anganwadi workers, who are the biggest, who were the force behind the COVID, uh, I would say dealing with COVID pandemic and the strength, they're not recognized as workers. A PWD, Public Works Department worker, who breaks stones and has broken stones and was on a daily wage, he is made regular. But Anganwadi workers and Asha workers have not. So the, what I'm trying to say is this, ultimately all the institutions are made with the same kind of thinking. In fact, it's quite interesting. I, I was in the government. And um, in the government, in the IAS, there used to be a rule, uh, which frankly and fortunately was challenged, which said that if you are married, and if you find that your work is not up to the mark, you could be dismissed from service. I mean, that was ridiculous. That's the state has made a rule which is talking about equality of access and then tells you. In the earlier years, if a fo woman was in the foreign service and if she got married, she had to leave the job. So, you know, so this, I mean, I'm just trying to show how the thinking of the state, or just look at what's happened to the labor code recently. Domestic workers are not included. Why are domestic workers not included? I would just, I mean, everybody else is. They've been included for uh, under the DV and so on, but not under the labor because people are worried, who's going to do my work? They don't want that. That's part of the haze. Not thinking through what they actually is doing or doing it in your self-interest. So all I'm trying to say is these things are all interrelated. Uh, it's not as if you can break it into private, public. Everything impinges on everything else. So basically, what we are aiming now is that in order to create public spaces, we need actually to look at the institutions and bring about transformation in the institutions, which would then impact on how public access takes place. Uh, to, I mean, how public spaces are used. And here, that would ensure safety. And we're talking public about public spaces in the broadest sense, which also includes, you know, we'll go into what public spaces are used for, but also as a site for political, you know, expression, et cetera, as well. Now, just one thing I want to say, I, I am talking, and I don't think it's very appropriate in a way, about women and transgenders. but. Women are not homogenous, we know that. And, in, and this representation also requires some change, because I just took this from somewhere. But basically, you need to be able to think always in intersectional terms. The reality of a rural woman in Karnataka and a rural woman in North India would be different the reality of an urban woman in Delhi and an urban woman in the US would be different. So, you know, looking at things like disability, sexual orientation, nationality, caste, in, in our cl class we need to add caste, we need to add rural urban, but everything needs to be looked at through an intersectional lens. And, and I would just say let's never talk in generic terms of women and men, you know, rural woman, rural man, disabled woman, disabled, that makes it easier to categorize. Next. What are public spaces and what are the perceptions of our public spaces? Basically, 
one of the things that seems to dictate a lot of behavior of women and even of men towards women and their interrelationship with public space is the fear of what could happen in terms of harassment or sexual assault or whatever. That is one kind of thing which goes through. It determines the way you dress. It determines the time you go out. It de de determines a whole lot of things. That is one part of thing. But it even determines the way you walk, where you walk, all these things. Then the second thing is, of course, very important is work. In terms of work, it's you see the state is actually should create a harassment-free kind of environment. I mean, a few years ago, as many of you would know, in Maharashtra, they suddenly told w women who had been working in bars for years that you know they could no longer work because it was unsafe. And these women who depended on that work for their livelihoods were sent home. And actually, it was the duty of the state to say, we'll ensure you get home properly. I mean, after all, that's what happens to girls who work in call centers. I mean, they are dropped, they are picked up, or you ensure that there are buses for people. Those women actually went back and they fought a case. They won the case, but they won the case years afterwards when they were too old. So, it was a, so what I'm saying is that work, in a way, it's a site for work, the fact that women look with, you know, for safe places, even when they're in the informal sector and they're street vendors where they can have other people around them. Uh, the, you know, women are congregated at the bottom of, of the informal sector pyramid. You know, they're either domestic workers, they earn the least and are least protected. But it's very interesting when they move around, they try and they're good. There's an interesting paper and I'm not going to go into that, about how people create an environment of trust around them through familiarity with people, what somebody calls the familiar publics, which you'll hear about, which I won't go into. But I'm just saying, so that is also the whole aspect of work. And you know, we've had such horrendous cases of working women, I don't even want to go in the whole Nirbhaya stuff and all. I mean, this is just one thing, and every day there are cases like that, so it's, it's horrible. And it all happens in the work thing. Then why else do women go out? They need access to services, whether it's health, education, housing, childcare, which there isn't enough of, house, working women's hostels. So that's also another relationship with them with the thing. Leisure and enjoyment. <laughs> women don't have enough time for it. There's a lot of data to show that women spend at least, you know, I mean, and universally spend at least four times or five times the amount of time than men on, you know, household work and so on. But a very interesting experiment took place in um, thing about, you know, I was talking about parks. And one of the reasons people don't go out is because they feel unsafe. And in, this was observed, and I think there's a very good case in this book by, um, which I, would, I actually quite enjoyed reading. It's on the gender data gap. It's called Invisible Women by, um, yeah, you read it? Yeah. So, so there's that very interesting case about Vienna, where the mayor noticed that you, know, you don't have, uh, that men work in uh, play in parks, and that if the park is broken up into smaller areas and has multiple entrances, many more women come. And apparently that has formed the blueprint for, for um, a park in, in the whole of Austria. So, that's a, so I mean, just having access to leisure places is also something which one has to think about, but rarely enters urban planners' minds. And a lot of the urban planners are men. I mean, it's simple. Then an area for solidarity and public expression. We had such a good ex experiences. I mean, that's also a use of public space. And we had such good examples in Delhi of Shaheen Bagh. And of course, it's through the public space that women 
move from one place to the other, the transport, communicate, and so on. So all that happens in the public space. It's nice. So I'm just going to talk about two things. One is about violence, and the other is about transgenders. And just to say that one of the issues, and it's going to come up very much in one of the papers yes, later, is that there's a huge, huge, huge discrepancy between the reported figures of crimes against women and the actual harassment in cases. And that every study, there was a World Bank study last year that showed 80% of the people they interviewed. This is a very old study of 2015, 2016, which showed that almost 90% women said that at some stage they'd face sexual harassment and that there are issues such as, you know, there are times when they feel more scared than other times when it's very dark. Some people feel scared all the time. But just to say how important a part it is of women's psyche, about this fear of violence in public spaces in India. So that violence and fear of violence has affects girls' mobility. And actually, it affects mobility, what time you can go out, how you travel. That's why it's very, you know, all these all women buses, having metros with commuter, with one thing which is just for women, one wagon, they play an important role because they create a feeling of, at least in their protection, because just now when there's a discomfort in having bodies very close to each other in metros. Then uh, it impacts access to work, as I gave you the example of Maharashtra, what time you can go, what, you know, and social activities, you can't come home at night, you can't work, because it also is related to the fact, that, I mean, violence against women impacts work, but the other thing which also we need to be very aware of, whether it's in rural India or urban India, one thing that really impacts on women's access to the public space is also the lack of full day care facilities. The fact that there are very few facilities for all day creches. Rural areas, you might have ICDS, Anganwadi centers, but they stop at 12. It impedes you from doing even a full day job at, in Manrega, because how do you do that full day's work when you have to go and drop your kids and pick up your kids. So understanding that access to public spaces is linked to governments also making provisions to take into account care. And then uh, and it obviously impacts on the whole, on the nature of development of the city. Next. Basically, when it comes to transgenders, I think uh, I just wanted to make a few points, and that was about, which I've already said, but I will repeat with a few illustrations, is that historically, what they call hijras in the north or transgenders, the whole perception was that these are criminals, whether it was a part of the Indian Penal Code, where they sort of said they're unnatural, uh, or the Telangana Unix Act, there was a history of criminalization. So they were always viewed as somebody out, outside the pale of, of society. Of course, this case in 2014, Al Service Union of India was paths, as, as they say, not path breaking, but path marking, because it gave equal rights. Uh, but um, but what has really changed? It's like a lot of acts we have in the sphere of violence against women, even on the women's side, dowry prohibition. The actual implementation and thought that goes into it is so poor that things don't change. Educational institutions, there is some provision in some states for scholarships, but somebody who wanted to do the NEAT test, you know, for becoming a doctor, had huge issues about getting their form accepted. So what I'm saying is it's not as if with one blanket order everything is open, it has opened doors. It hasn't. Everything has to be a case. And that is true for women too. I mean, every time when women enter the public space, in a privileged thing, whether you enter as a, I don't know what they call in Karnataka, in the north we call it Patwari, the land revenue account. Every time, or when the women entered the police, whether it was Kiran Bedi, it was, I mean, 
either you have to fight a case, you have to go through a whole process in order to get the equality which actually has already been pronounced. But it's never a straight path. So the economic exclusion, I think one of the points is that there's so little scope for transgenders, you know, to actually earn money, that em employment and reservation makes a lot of sense. But that's why they are cornered into doing begging, sex work, whatever. I mean, and it's also the way they live, because they live in communities which have, you know, they're on the fringes of society. They're not accepted to live in a normal house and colony, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, a lot of institutions are very, let's say, violent when it comes to dealing with them. The police treat with them very roughly. Medical institutions don't recognize them. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, they don't have facilities. Of course, now in the West, they've started sort of these, you know, toilets and things which have any, I mean, all genders can access, etc. But in India, it's still difficult, you know. And, uh, even where there are schemes, and that is something which, you know, Nivi mentioned was that where there are schemes, you need to look at what the figures say. Because there is a scheme which is, you know, for uh, livelihoods of all, which includes transgenders, but the total amount is so minuscule that it can hardly sustain 32 shelters in the whole country. So that, and similarly, when it comes to another scheme which they have, with, which is a skilling scheme called Dash, Daskari something, actually the scheme includes in the heading transgenders, etc. When it came to actual dispersion, the ministry would not give figures. Finally, there was an RTI done by somebody to find out how many transgenders got the thing, zero. So what I'm saying is, there's many a slip, which you think. So implementation is not always, it's a question of allocation of funds, but it's also a question of utilization and implementation. Next. So this is basically just to say that these are the kind of things that, you know, the services and amenities which actually need to be thought of at all stages, you know, like one-stop centers, and there's a very excellent calculation done by, I don't know who's written by you, of the huge gap there is between, first of all, the amount of funds allocated and the actually already existing one-stop centers. There's a gap in that. In addition to the fact that one-stop centers can never meet the needs of people who need one-stop centers, because one-stop centers, you can't stay for more than four or five days. So there's a huge gap there. And then there's the other point is that there's so much under-reporting. So, I mean, even the figures get a bit things. Then, uh, now, even where they're for homeless women, if they're night shelters, you see them in Delhi, under the bridges, under the flyovers. And what night shelters they build are right in the periphery. You know, it's it's scary. It's it's actually more dangerous, and they probably get they're there with their children, and there have been cases of molestation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all these things require a lot of thought being put in. Uh, policing. I mean, the whole issue about the police force as it is. It's first of all, there's an issue that they complain about not having enough resources, but there's the issue of their own sensitization, the numbers of women, the way they actually, the delays they have in filing cases, the kind of sensitivity they bring, I think that requires a lot of work. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of education and health facilities, which are in the public domain. And you know, there have been studies to show that in urban areas, if you go, if you cut out the reproductive health um, you know, a thing where women have children and babies and so on. And then you look at bed usage in hospitals. The number of, if you cut out the reproductive health, the men are using many more beds in urban areas than women. So what I'm saying is you need to look at all those aspects too. What is the, how much is the government spending on women's health in urban areas, in rural areas, etc. Because it's an issue again of access. Then infrastructure, I've been on the toilets. Again, from that book, there was a lovely example that apparently wherever toilets are made, they're made in equal numbers for men and women. 
and that actually she gives an example which I found quite, I could relate to. She said when you go to a play in in London at, at the, in a theater, there'll be huge queues of women and men. And she said women have to shut the door, put their handbag up, take double the time, etc. But the number of toilets is roughly the same. So there's nobody's really thought about the time. I mean, there's some sort of so pavements. I mean, and the other thing is, how do you? You need to ask women what they want. I mean, a lot of the Nirbhaya Fund, for three years when the government gave, was it 5,000 crores, it wasn't used for two years. Then the third year when it was used, about a whole lot was used on CCTVs. CCTVs are important, yes, but not when they are substituting for everything else. Police vans and CVC TVs top the list of the expenditure. But actually, when you start asking women what they want, they want much better street lighting. That's much more important. That creates safety, you know, that creates confidence. But that is not something which has been prioritized. And um, then when you come to mobility, one thing is very clear. The way women use transport and men are different. Men seem to make one big trip. Women make a lot more trips, according to a lot of the data that sh exists. And Based on that, what is, they say is that, you know, women need to, um, you know, the, the whole way timetables are set up, et cetera, et cetera, quite often looks at the commuter, the male commuter. So I don't know. I, I, I mean, I don't think, but this is what the literature says. And uh, definitely in India, if you go to London, uh, there, I mean, and so on, you begin to see a lot of women drivers, et cetera. But here, we haven't reached. There's the token woman here and there. And what it requires is that women are in all public places. Because when you begin to see a critical mass of women, whether it's in the civil service, in the judiciary, in the law, then the culture of that organization changes. When you have a token woman, it doesn't change. It, she begins to take on the norms of the majority. So I just want to, again, say that this planning and budgeting is extremely important. It has to be participatory. You have to ask people what they want. You know, it's not good enough for somebody to sit in a ministry and say, I think they want this, it's, which is what normally happens. And, uh, and then there are huge data gaps. That's something we need to understand. We don't have the data. The data that we have about the census for transgenders is from 2011. 2011 was when, you know, it was still criminalized. So there's no information out there in the public domain. So that's something that's required. Then sch making schemes. What Basically, the allocation of resources and monitoring their utilization is critical. So this is, no, you, does everybody recognize her? Yeah, yeah. So she was passed away. The reason I mentioned because she's the person who's responsible for women coming into jury service in America. You know, I'm just saying that women are required everywhere, and these are all places in the public space. Next, next. So I just want to say that this is a this framework is very for when you're thinking of. Uh, gender responsive budgeting or even planning anything is extremely important because that helps you to put together the situation, the policy intervention, the nature of budget allocations, and what outputs and outcomes, what gaps there are. So this Debbie Budlander's thing I think is, is, is actually a very useful framework to use and I think uh, you start with the situation. And uh, I'll just say, uh, looking forward, that basically you have to look based on rights towards public spaces, that everybody has a right, it's no favor, it's, it's what you need to have. You need to determine needs in a participatory way. Gender data is a big, big issue when it comes to public spaces. We don't have data. And the stuff, kind of work that these four panelists are doing is very, very important because it really throws light on the big gaps. Uh, I think enhancing awareness, you know, even things like knowing about women's helplines and so on, which are so important in the public space. Even women don't know, just sensitization. What I found quite interesting is in Lucknow, they've named a public area, Dasso Nabe Chok. Now everybody knows 
that Dasu Nabe is the women's helpline. You ask him, Dasu Nabe kyun? Women ka helpline hai, women ka help. So probably something like that. Gender responsive planning and budgeting should underlie everything. And what I think is even if we allocate funds and do something, monitoring and evaluation is very, very weak, extremely weak. And I think individuals have to be accountable for ensuring gender equality in all spheres, but also in public spaces. I'll stop there. So I'll open the floor for questions, and then you can ask the question. We have about 10, 10 to 15 minutes, so we'll try and take as many as we can in that time. We talk about private as the household and public as not the household, but even within the public spaces, there's private and public, privatized and, pub and public spaces, right? And I think a lot of places that women would like to access, for instance, are are private, I mean, you know, I would say like, you know, large apartment complexes with their, you know, gardens and their pools or, you know, malls. These are all places where women might consider themselves safer, perhaps because there's some policing presence of other people and so on. But because they're private spaces, even though they're technically public, they still have limited access to that. So I just wanted to sort of nuance even public spaces have private and public spaces due to large apartment complexes. So women who were private, you know, previously would have been able to cut across, now has to take a longer and perhaps unsafe way because that space has no longer access yeah. available to yeah. her, right? Yeah. That's true. That's because uh, one of the ways, I mean, I thought the talk was very interesting and I think your conversation around private is actually very important. Also because we tend to also create private within public spaces, not in just the physical demarcation of it, but also in terms of the relationships that we have within that, right? So for example, uh, this has happened to me and I'm sure you might have seen it. You will see an argument happening between a couple, let's say, right? And even if violence happens during that moment in a public space, it is considered a private moment, right? It's considered a private moment and you see a lot of the spaces, especially in areas outside, right, in the Angans, where it is considered, I mean, what at what point does that space become public-private? So it's not, I think, physicality that matters a whole lot, but the kinds of relationships that you're able to form within that public-private space, which also I feel, I mean, one way of looking at it is, that because that's a private space, you can't interfere. But I also feel like what that also gives us is a way in which to, I mean, you'll see in the paper later, is how you can also create private spaces of <coughs> feeling safe within public spaces also, right? So the idea of, I mean, what I would, what we would, I like to have a conversation around later also, starting with your kind of engagement in, actually starting with both of your engagement on physicality of private is also the notional and discursive idea of private because that is what gets constantly formed and reformed within public spaces, right? So that's actually a very critical aspect of what then defines publicness and what then defines what's private because what then is, is it legal? Is it physical? Is it based on certain kinds of structures? What does that mean? Any questions? Shruti. Uh, this is uh, a small grouse actually. So there is this app called Safety Pin that was also uh, mentioned when you, in your talk. It was a lovely talk, thank you for that. And uh, one of the challenges with the design of an app like that is it asks you to mark spaces that are unsafe. Now, even the UN guidelines say that if you're a marker of a safe space is where more people actually are there in a space, it becomes naturally more s safer for someone. Now, if somebody goes and marks a space as unsafe, Whoever is using the app also avoids those spaces, right? So in essence, you're adding to the problem by having a solution like this, which supposedly uses data and technology, but does exactly opposite of what it is supposed to do, which is contributes more to the problem, right? So I think one of the things also here is, uh, during the discussions about public, private, what do you deem as safety? What do you deem as data around this? What do you deem as an intervention that will actually add to the problem or, you know, cause for, say, more moral policing and things like that. So just wanted to put it out there. Thank you. I think the purpose of the app is actually in real time. Is in, it's, it's in real time, isn't it? That people are supposed that this area is, is not very safe if you're uh, looking so at it. There are these uh, SOS applications which are like Pratibandi and, uh, you know, some other kind of, uh, you know, I forget the names of these. 
Uh, so those are supposed to be real time where you press it and it's like a panic yeah, button. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now, one of the challenges with that is we also do not have the institutional infrastructure to support yeah. an intervention, right? So for example, if I press a button and say I'm in distress, right, nobody is there to support me. And some amount of the little data that exists also says that bystanders often even participate. Yeah. So is it even yeah. useful for you to, you know, like talk to, like a, a sound of an alarm that something is happening? And also the way the data is collected and presented, right? So if suppose I'm planning a trip, to go from point A to point B. And I look at this app and say, okay, this is an unsafe place, let me avoid it. Somebody actually going over there will be benefited from me also participating in that public space. So you're actually yeah. drawing more invisible boundaries around that in some ways? In a way you're reducing, but I guess there's, I mean, I don't, I'm not uh, frankly think, but I guess there must be some issue about the element of possible risk at a particular point in time. And I, I think, it's sort of like better to take the precaution rather than, I mean, it's the same mindset. Right, so the, yeah. there's this lovely book called Weil Loiter, which actually speaks yeah. about, you know, this, this temptation of risk that is there, that you want to go to a place that is not fully safe, yeah. right? You also want to take a risk. But the question is by make, putting, uh, uh, designing an app around it and making it yeah, ossified I, in a way. I see what yeah. it becomes, a it becomes institutionalized in exactly. a way. But I think, the part of that, if I may just sort of think, idea is that if there is an unsafe place, because they also link it with the safe, safety audits, don't they? And, they? and then the point is that this is supposed to lead to intervention. It's supposed to actually, okay, so this area is not good. What do we need to do in order to change its character? That is valid. Yeah. So that aspect of it. So that is around. that is the whole thought process. Right. So you I'm know. saying that it's, it's like you know the road to wherever is paved with good intentions. Yeah. Intentions are good. You know you do want to do this, but the way you do it because technology also brings with its own set, like a regime, right? Like yeah. you're bringing in an institute, yeah. like you're ossifying it, you're putting in this for posterity. Yeah. There are so many other aspects that design and technology introduces. I, I think all I just wanted to say is that it's also good to have a critical eye when we think about these yeah. app-based interventions and data-based interventions and because data also comes with so many Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to ask a question sort of linking it back to the panel discussion that we had over there. Um, just to, it's a slightly convoluted question, I promise I'll get to the point. Um, it's just about the, the space between the Austria example as opposed to the street lights example. Between, between the Austria example where they added more entrances to the park, where like there seemed to be an actual thought process going into how to actually make this place safer versus a street light example where the state seems to have thought as far as how can we do this while also retaining power? Uh, is, the, is the difference between those two independent institutions? Is it having those institutions that think about, like have a solution oriented mindset towards this as opposed to a power retaining oriented mindset? I'm sorry if that was. You're saying as opposed to a street light solution. First of all, the street light, the park, the street light solution is something which creates or removes the risk and enhances confidence. But the issue in India is that there is very little, I'm talking across the country, like you have a huge Nirbhaya fund. What you could have done with it, 5,000 crores, is you could have taken all this you know, peripheral, dark areas. In one year, well, it was a no-brainer, actually. You could have afforded and got street light. But that's not something that planners thought was appropriate. They would rather spend money on hardware, I, I, I'm, because it's a purchase. It's hardware, you know, and it enhances the police's resources. And uh, I think it's a question of how you prioritize. Now, you never ask the women, and that's the starting point. You have to ask the women what will make them in village. You know, there are areas where women walk through at night which are very dark and shady. The moment there's light, it changes the whole character of the place. But what I'm saying is, it's how do you prioritize that? And I, I don't quite understand why for years money remained unutilized. It, I mean, it didn't require rocket science, you know. Hmm? 
quite a lot still remains unutilized. And it's, it has been given to the states and the imagination stops at buying police vans and putting CCTV cameras. And those CCTV cameras are sometimes not even in the transport. They're, you know, in some random, they're in some crowded places and so on. Are you asking about state responsibility? One of the one of the possible answers between like having, I'm sorry, I think I just lost. No, I think you know independent institutions like in Delhi, I can say, and all many of you would have been involved, and probably there are people in this room who know more about it than me. You know, like I know that, for instance, Jagori was very involved with the Safe City Initiative, and it had a lot of impact on a lot of things that happened in Delhi, like the the whole metro additional thinking because of this relationship. But you know, th that model, all I have to say is every time when you bring about something change or innovative, it shouldn't have to depend on some foreign donor funding or something. It needs to come from the system as it is. And that too was part of a safe cities program, which is funded by UN women, et cetera, et cetera, which is fine. The point is it happened in one city. What happens to the rest? So, I mean, it, you know, it needs a lot of sitting. Now I don't know, there was, um, there was a meeting which Nivi and I went to, which was a national stakeholder budget, gender budget meeting, where they were asking each department, what do you want in the budget for next year? Um, I don't know whether it was, in Hindi there's a word called khana purti, you know, uh, saying that you've filled it, you've ticked the box, we've done our consultation. That's what I said to Nivi, that I think we are part of this tick box consultation where they say we've consulted. And uh, I don't know whether any of the suggestions, some of which were very good, are actually going to be taken on board. But, uh, but, but you know, you can only go on trying. And I must say, there are a group of people who constantly do, just like they have the women's budget group in the UK, which meets, there's a group in Delhi which has people, the Feminist Policy Collective, which also has a national consultation, gives its findings to the Ministry of Finance, Women and Child, et cetera, et cetera, for what it's worth. Thank you, uh, everyone.